audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. God is reminding Daniel and the king that history will only reach its goal by a supernatural agent coming from the outside in, that one day the stone is going to fall. Now, what is the overarching truth then of Daniel? Why did the Spirit of God supply this narrative in Daniel 2, and how is it connected with the applause of heaven? Today. 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 Today with Jeff Vines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me want to dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will bring this offering You are my wonder You bring the wonder Today 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 with Jeff Vines Hello and welcome. This is Today with Jeff Vines. And in a new message, Pastor Jeff talks about our coping mechanisms, how we avoid dealing with trivial stuff or more important things like the meaning of our lives and our God relationships. In Daniel chapter 5, the new king responds to the impending invasion of a neighbouring enemy by throwing a massive party. Here's Pastor Jeff with the message. I love to see somebody who's been gifted uh, to use their talent for a purpose greater than themselves. It's inspiring, isn't it? When somebody you can tell has a very, very cool gift. I know cool is not the greatest word I could use, but I wish I could play the piano. I wish I could. I mean, how many of you sing in the shower? <laughs> how many of you sing very well in the shower? Yeah, okay. Now, here's my question to you. Do you think there's ever applause in heaven? Do you think there's ever a time where... The angels just break out in applause, and God the Father high fives the Son, uh, and the Holy Spirit's just, you know, pumped. Is there ever a time you think that happens? And I know on one occasion we were told that when somebody far from God comes near to God, that happens. But, you know, there's another time that happens. There's a time that something we do catalyzes this round of applause in heaven. So much so that Jesus can't wait to tell us about it until we get to heaven. So he mentions it in his preaching in the New Testament. And I want to take you through this, Daniel chapter 2, and lead you to that place. We're we're in a series called Now, and we're asking the question, how is it that you and I as Christians can live in this non-Christian world? And we discover that there is a definitive way that you and I are supposed to live. And when we live that way, and we're not just talking about purity and holiness and doing everything right, but when we live that way, there's applause that just circulates through heaven that, that, that culminates or crescendos in the day that we meet Jesus. So I'm in Daniel chapter 2. And we find a king who's had a dream. This is what it says in verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. Now, here's a guy that is not a weak king. This is not typical of, of King Nebuchadnezzar not being able to sleep. He's one of the greatest leaders in human history. Archaeological digs have unearthed astounding information about this guy. He's powerful, strategic. He's a very clever leader. He's also, historians believe, responsible for the hanging gardens of Babylon, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So not only is he confident and calculating and competent, he's very creative. He's also a very powerful king. Daniel 5, 19, those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. So here's a king that has enormous power, but the wind has gone out of his cells and he can't sleep because he keeps having this dream that is irritating it's causing great concern and worry. Have you, ever had, have you ever had a dream again and again? You just wake up and you start walking the halls? Well, here's the dream. The great king sees a great statue of great splendor. The head of the statue is pure gold. The chest and arms are of silver. The belly and thighs are of bronze. The legs are of iron. The feet are partly of iron and partly baked clay. And the thing that concerns him is one, here is a strong statue with feet of clay, and then there's this rock, a tiny rock, not made with human hands, 
that comes out of the heavens and strikes this statue and it crumbles to the ground. And then this little rock grows into this enormous mountain. The reason King Nebuchadnezzar is trouble, now stay with me, you got to do the homework if you expect the good stuff to come out. The reason the king is troubled is because he's smart. He knows basically, generally speaking, what this dream means, that there is a strong kingdom that has feet of clay, and one day this little rock is going to destroy it. So think about it. You and I don't have the gift of dream interpretation, but if we, even, even though we don't, if we heard King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we could make a pretty good guess, couldn't we? And King Nebuchadnezzar knows that. He wants not a general interpretation. He wants a specific interpretation because he hopes that by discovering a few of the identities of the players involved, he'll be able to circumvent the process, attack first, annihilate his enemy, and then save his kingdom. He's kind of like uh, Doc Brown in Back to the Future. He's hoping that your future hasn't been written yet. No one's has. Your future is whatever you make it, so make it a good one. King Nebuchadnezzar is trying to produce a good future. He wants to be worshiped and adored by future generations. And the very reason he came to Babylon in the first place was to build an enormous and an impressive self. And now here is this pesky little stone that's going to ruin everything. So he says, who will tell me what this dream means? Now, the next part of chapter two is he calls for the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are the Babylonian wise men. They have a degree in pseudoscience called divination. They communicate with the evil spirits. They believe strongly in astrology, and they believe that the stars can enable them to interpret dreams. Now, here's what I didn't know that I learned this past week. King Nebuchadnezzar was not a fan. He thought these dream interpreters were charlatans because every time he got the interpretation, it was so general, anybody could have given it. He thinks it's all carnival trickery. But he can't put an end to the wise men because they're so steeped in Babylonian culture that if he were to do that, it would be political suicide. So instead, he decides he's going to call these guys together. And he is sleepless in Babylon. So if he's not sleeping, neither is anyone else. And he says, tell me the interpretation of this dream. But when he speaks to the Chaldeans, he says with a twist, if you are really able to do what you claim you're able to do, if you really are in touch with the supernatural world, and if the supernatural world does indeed exist and communicates with you, and you as a priest have this special power to be a medium between supernatural world and our world, then not only can you tell me the interpretation of the dream, you should be able to tell me the dream as well. Tell me what I dreamed. Now, the problem with this is, uh, these guys have been living off the palace food, the palace wine, the palace harem, everything, they're paid handsomely for being able to translate these dreams. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to call them on the carpet. He says, okay, guys, your time is up. Either tell me the dream and its meaning, or you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill all of you and your houses are going to be turned to rubble. That's, that's pressure, man. That's pressure. What is their response? They respond by saying, no one can do what you ask. Now that is a telling statement because basically what they're telling the king, king, we're just kidding. Nobody really knows the supernatural world. And if there is one, it doesn't really communicate to us. I mean, I know this, this science that we've been educated in, but tell you the truth, nobody can do what you're asking. We can't tell you what you dreamed. We don't know. But if you tell us, we'll take a good shot at the meaning. King Nebuchadnezzar is so angry that in verse 12, he orders the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Now again, why is the king so angry? Well, he knows what the dream means ultimately. And we spend so much time as theologians or people trying to understand the Bible, we want to understand what each kingdom, what kingdoms are represented by each section of the statue. And there's so much to talk about in Daniel too because the only plausible explanation, if Daniel did write this around 530 BC, the only way he would know about the coming Medo-Persians and the Greek kingdom and the Romans and beyond was if this was a supernatural book, if it was the word of God. That's a sermon in and of itself. But what you and I need to learn 
is why is this narrative included for you and me? What, what, what is all this about? King has a dream. It's interpreted. Daniel interprets it. He has this vision of a huge statue of kingdoms that will come, but they will all be destroyed. The stone comes out of nowhere. It's supernatural, not made with hands. Why do we care about that? Now, stay with me. Be patient. The king is very angry. Well, part of it is because he's, he's losing sleep. You ever get irritable when you're not sleeping? He's angry. So what does he do? Part of what he does is he says, okay, just kill all these guys. Just kill all the wise men. That's a little bit over the top, isn't it? Just kill them all. Kill them dead. Do away with them. And the problem with that is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are part of the wise men. Now, they're not part of this particular committee or meeting, but they are some of the wise men, which means that they're going to be killed. They're going to die. Now, when Daniel hears the news that this is happening, he believes in the supernatural world. He believes that there is a God and this God speaks for all who will hear. He wants desperately to hear from God. And he knows that this time is the time that he can contextualize his monotheism into a culture that's polytheistic. Maybe this is the time he can show that there truly is just one God. And he also believes that he's been sent to this time and this place and given a specific gift to help a king who is far from God come near to God. So Daniel goes to his small group, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he says to the boys, boys, I got to tell you, unless we understand this dream and interpret it, we're all going to die. And what's amazing is before Daniel knows with certainty that God is going to tell him the dream and its meaning, Look what happens in verse 14. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. We keep hearing this about Daniel. Wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. This is amazing because how did Daniel get Arioch not to kill him? Arioch's supposed to kill Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if he doesn't do it, the king's probably going to kill him. But Daniel's so respected because of the type of person that he is, he actually gets Arioch to pause and to allow Daniel to have an audience with the king. And then he convinces the king to wait. Wait, just give us some time and we'll tell you the dream and its interpretation. But Daniel assumes that God is going to give him the dream and the interpretation, which is why he asks for time. Why does he do this? Because Daniel has an inner conviction that God has given him peculiar gifts, particular gifts, it is peculiar, the ability to interpret dreams, to be used at the highest level of the state for the purposes of God. And this is exactly what Daniel was doing. Daniel's priority was what then? Kingdom of God, right? Kingdom of God. He lives for, we talked about that last week. He lives for the kingdom of God. He lives to see the kingdom of God progress. So this is a perfect opportunity for him. And what happens? He's right. God did tell him the dream and the interpretation. And Daniel is so happy, he sings a song. Let me tell you, if God told you something that was going to spare your life, you'd be happy and you'd sing a song too. And listen to the words, because we learn a lot. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. So let's hold off on the application just for a moment. Daniel interprets the dream of the king. He tells them this is what it means. And here's his translation. Your majesty, verse 37, you are the king of kings. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, who came to Babylon to build a splendiferous self, is going to be happy to hear those words. You're the man. You're the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. Now, if you're the king, you're thinking, whoo, I'm the man. I am the head of gold. And then then Daniel says, but you're not going to last. There's going to be three kingdoms that will come after you. And they won't last either although one will be very strong and crush all the others. And then he says, and by the way, let me take a breath here. We could spend six months on this book and I'm trying to do it in 35 minutes or at least on this chapter. 
But I want you to notice a few things along the way, because in verse 44, in the time of those kings, so during the time of these kings and kingdoms, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. So this is not, this stone is not a kingdom that is the fifth kingdom on planet earth. This kingdom is actually operating during the time of some of the kingdoms that are operating. You with me? It's not another human kingdom. That's why we're told it's not made with hands, nor will it be left to another people. It's not a kingdom that people inherit in generation after generation on planet earth. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. So now, now that we know there is a kingdom that is coming that is not a man-made kingdom that is going to last forever, what does that have to do with you and me? And what does it have to do with the applause of heaven? All right, first, there are things that we learn that we think we know them, but we live as though we do not. And the first is this, no king, president, prime minister, dictator, or any other leader rules without God's permission. You understand that? That, that makes sense because if God is truly sovereign and all-powerful, then he could remove any leader anytime, anywhere, right? God is truly large and in charge. He could take anybody out at any time. Now, this is one of the major arguments the skeptic or the non-Christian has against Christianity and the Christian God, because their next comment is going to be this. You're telling me that God allows a guy like Mugabe or Lenin or Stalin or Hitler to stay on the throne as long as they do and wreak havoc on humanity? Now, I want to answer this question in full detail next week. Sorry. I, if I go down this path, we're never going to get to what Daniel 2 is ultimately about. I will tell you that one of the favorite illustrations is Sam Gamgee in Lord of the Rings. When he, he, he comes to the conclusion that everything one day is going to become untrue, that all those times in our lives in history that seem to appear useless or senseless Suddenly, when the Lord returns, everything's going to be turned right side up again. And those things that brought enormous sadness into our lives, suddenly they're going to start to make sense. And you would expect God, if God exists, to contradict you at some point. And you would expect God to, to have access to knowledge and wisdom that you just don't have. And, and the, the minute you say, well, I just find that preposterous, then I'm going to take you back to the number one symbol of our faith, the cross where it appeared that evil was winning, that God had lost, that the disciples would never be able to gather back together and change anything, that there was a senseless, meaningless crime against someone who was a sinless, perfect, righteous human being. And yet God takes this atrocity and turns it into the greatest feat of humanity, the salvation of the world. You with me? So these are clues. The other thing that we don't get to talk about often is that no matter what happens in this world, God can recover until you start looking at things in your life through the lens of eternity, nothing's going to make any sense to you. But when you look through the lens of eternity, then you realize that no matter what happens here, God is able to recover. Why? When I lived in New Zealand and the tsunami hit in 2004, one of the, one of the, the strongest accusations against Christ, against the kingdom of God and the Christian belief in a merciful good God was this. How could your good God allow all these little children to die in this tsunami? And my response was always the same. First of all, I think God hurts when things happen. But at the same time, God can recover because he who gave life once can give it again. And the former life is nowhere near as glorious as the next life. So see, you and I, when we take a life, we can't recover because we don't have the power to give it back. When God allows a life to pass, he can recover because the next life he gives is glorious, far more glorious than anybody can imagine. And it's ultimately what every one of us in this room is after. And so that's just part of the answer. Second though, the thing that we're supposed to learn in Daniel 2, no matter how strong or brilliant a kingdom is, it always has one major weakness. What is the major weakness of every earthly kingdom? People. They're flawed. They have feet of clay, no matter how strong the kingdom is, right? Do you know why this church is not perfect? Because you're here. <laughs> and if you're looking for one, in heaven's name, don't go there. You'll ruin it. I mean, there's no such thing. People are going to wound you. People are going to offend you. They're all sinners in this room who need the same grace that you need. One of my favorite Illustrations is G.K. Chesterton. The New York Times ran an article years ago 
what's wrong with the world? And they ask writers all over the world to, to write in. And people wrote paragraph after paragraph, here's what's wrong with the world. G.K. Chesterton responded with what is sure to be the shortest letter ever written to the editor. He said, in regards to your article, what's wrong with the world? I am yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> you and I are what's wrong with the world. If you're looking for some kind of government on planet earth to produce a utopian lifestyle, it's never going to happen because they're all flawed. Socialism, communism, capitalism, monarchy, anarchy, they all fall short. You should never put your faith in any political system or person. But the point still goes, doesn't it? The Enlightenment told us that advancement in science and technology would bring about the utopian dream. And what did it do instead? It gave us more advanced means to kill each other. D.L. Moody one time was on an airplane and he was seated beside a guidance counselor. And the guidance counselor, when she found out D.L. Moody was a preacher, said, if you had one piece of advice to give a graduating high school student, what would it be? And D.L. Moody was brilliant at deflection. So he said, well, before I answer you, you answer. What, what would you... What, what a piece of advice would you give all these students? And she goes, well, I would tell them whatever they do, make sure they get a good education. And D.L. Moody said, well, it's been my experience. If you take somebody who is stealing railway from the railway tracks and you give them a good education, they'll steal the whole railway line. <laughs> do you hear what he's saying? No education deals with the problem of humanity, which is the heart of man. So God is reminding Daniel and the king that history will only reach its goal. This is the whole point here by a supernatural agent coming from the outside in, that one day the stone is going to fall. Now, you with me so far? Now, what is the overarching truth then of Daniel? Why did the Spirit of God supply this narrative in Daniel 2, and how is it connected with the applause of heaven? Well, let me read again from the text. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands, struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that stood, that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. And then he says in verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Now, do you see what's happening? So rather than getting sidetracked and me showing you how accurate these prophecies were and what kingdom will come, can we step out of the, 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 the trees and, and see the forest? What's the big idea here? Well, while these kingdoms of men are progressing and wreaking havoc on humanity, there is another kingdom that exists simultaneously. Okay? Now, the kingdom of God is here, but not here. <laughs> it's here, but not yet. It's here in that Jesus established it when he first came to earth and died for your sins. And the kingdom of God comes upon the heart and mind of every believer. That kingdom exists at the same time as the earthly kingdoms, right? So it's here, but not yet. But one day it will be in full when Christ returns and that kingdom will be the kingdom that exists forever. So we know that. So that begs the question then, and this is what Daniel 2 is about. You get to decide which kingdom you're going to live for now. And you can't fool God because if you're truly living for the right kingdom, then there will be great intention to align your life with that kingdom and building that kingdom in the course of your existence. It's a beautiful thing because your direction will determine your destination. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you the rest of this message from Pastor Jeff. Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And as soon as you decide to start building the kingdom of God, He injects them with the power of the Spirit to cause them to come alive. God injects a power into you to be able to use you. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me day.
today. Today. Today with Jeff Fines. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.